in Hawaiian, the word we use here is mana. And mana is like you have your true light. And when you are distracted and want to people please or trying to react or respond or trying to make a good impression on this person on that person, every time you spend any time in that space, you're taken away from your mana for your vital source, for your true who you are. And the more you can lean into that, the more you know what to do. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel or welcome to the channel if you're new here. We have a fellow dog lover with us today. We have Dr. Faryal Michaud. She is a palliative care physician, a certified life coach. She is a mindfulness teacher both in meditation and in yoga, as well as a podcast host of what was formerly Write Your Last Chapter, and now it is Write Your Best Chapter. And she hosts amazing retreats where she is living in Hawaii. So we can't wait to hear all about that. But first, Farial, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I am so excited about everything that you stand for and also being just a guest on your show. I'd love to just chat with you. Yeah, me too. It's It's been a while since we've known each other and every single post that you write resonates so deeply. And I've just really appreciated the opportunity to be uh, connected on social media and now to have you here. Yeah, same. And I'd love to interview you on my podcast. It seems like two years ago, two plus years ago. Yeah. And also everything that you post deeply resonates with me. So I feel like kindred spirits chatting up right now. Yeah, definitely. And for the people who haven't met you yet, and me, I haven't heard your full backstory. I would love to hear more about you. Yeah, so um, I'm originally born and raised in Iran, and I lived through the revolution, lived through the Iran-Iraq bombing for eight years and all of that. And then, then when I finished high school, I took what now is called a gap year, but back then it wasn't a gap year. Uh, I took a year off and I traveled with up with people as a dancer. So I was a dancer before anything else. So after traveling the world with up with people, which was an amazing international organization, I settled uh, in the United States, went to undergrad and initially wasn't really decided if I wanted to go straight to medicine or did I want to do like bench research. So I was kind of debating on what do I want to do? And I joined a uh, dual degree program where I had the potential of getting a PhD, which, you know, initially was a full ride, which is already a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But um, after a year of that, I was like, you know, I don't want to do bench research. So after a year, I pulled out of the PhD section and just continued with my medical degree and um, really, really loved everything like and I remember when I was in med school they said if you love everything and you're reading New England Journal of Medicine for fun you your specialty is going to be internal medicine because yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. you love all the things and yep. sure enough I I went to I got my degree in Michigan State University did my residency in Arizona I have a lot nice. of friends still there and I did internal medicine I really liked academics I really liked hospital medicine so you know residency in internal medicine is so much like a hospitalist because you're in house and taking care of it. I didn't really care for outpatient medicine so I became an academic hospitalist right out of training but then because my husband at that point wanted to go to med school too we moved to California for his medical education and then I was a hospitalist there so the year I actually graduated from internal medicine residency, palliative care as a subspecialty, as a fellowship did not exist. So it wasn't until I was practicing inpatient medicine in, you know, day in, day out, that I just thought there's got to be a better way we can have conversation with these patients that I, I usually talk about conveyor belt, right? Uh, mom gets sick with a non-surgical aortic valve, uh, you know, gets admitted to the ER, through the ER, 
you know, sick enough to go to the ICU, gets a little better, goes to telemetry, gets a little better, goes to a nursing home for rehab and goes home only to be home for a month and then come back on this conveyor belt again. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, you know, we're not having real conversations. Like we just get mom good enough and putting essentially band-aid in a shotgun wound over and over again. And there's got to be a way that you can have better conversations. So that's when I was like, when I learned about palliative care specialty, I was like, ah, that's what I want to do truly. And so didn't have the opportunity to actually do a formal fellowship because I was the only breadwinner at that time. My husband is going to medical school. I had two little girls and there was nothing uh, as a formal training where we were. I had to go away. And so, but there was a program called PSEP, which is Palliative Care Education Program through Harvard, which was a seven month program. You do two weeks in house, the beginning at the end, and then this was, we didn't have virtual things, but it was virtual things. And we would meet wow. online and discuss cases. And it really was the most unbelievable adult education experience I've had in my life. And so when I finished that, and I was already sitting through IDT courses with the uh, local hospice. So I was able to sit for the palliative care and hospice board in 2012 and then completely shifted. So for the past 12 years, I have only been doing palliative care. Now I was initially doing inpatient palliative care and, you know, uh, in California, I was doing that. And, um, and then when we moved to Hawaii, which is where I am now, about seven years ago, I started by working inpatient palliative care still. And during COVID, it was really hard doing those end of life conversations with PPEs and an iPad. And I think I was just like traumatized a little bit. And when the opportunity came up to step away from medicine, I did. I left uh, clinical medicine um, like in early 20, mid 2022. And then came back and now I do outpatient palliative care, which I love. I work in a cancer center um, and I feel like I've found my home. So full circle, that's sort of my medical story. And I yeah. absolutely love taking care of uh, patients at that stage of their life. But I don't think I could do inpatient palliative care anymore. I think I'm still a little traumatized from the whole experience. Yeah. And I'm glad that you were able, it, every, as everything evolved, it's kind of the, those one degree turns and capturing everything that you've kind of having that awareness, like, oh, that clicks. Oh, that clicks. Oh, that clicks. How could I get closer to doing that? Mm -hmm. Can you share how those shifts happen for you? Because as you're identifying, you know, I love the physicians, mostly physicians watching this and we always have to do the formal training and you did formal training. You got your boards and everything, but when it came to identifying what you wanted to do next, how were you mm -hmm. able to make those decisions? So that's a very good question. I think that when, you know, like I remember when I was coming to Hawaii, because uh, I was a hospitalist and everywhere you go, like I always tell my medical students that if you don't know what you want to do and you want to live anywhere, you know, if you're a hospitalist, you can close your eyes and just like throw a dart on the US map and wherever it lands, you can find a job that day. Like That's how everyone is like short staff. And I remember that when I came here, I specifically didn't start medicine, like practicing clinical medicine for two months because I had two little girls and I wanted the two months for me to, you know, help them transition into their new life in Hawaii. And so, but when I came here, like immediately they're like, oh, I see Dr. Misho that, you know, you are, you know, um, hospitalist. If you want to pick up extra shifts, that's how they always like make it sound like, hey, who doesn't need extra money, right? Like if you want to pick up extra shift while you're waiting for your palliative care role. And I have to tell you, I think that by the time I moved to Hawaii, I, um, I'm a very different person now than I was 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I had little kids. I was treating my life like whack-a-mole and everything was popping up. I was super busy and my 
antidote to busyness was picking more things. Like at that stage of my life, like I had no business starting a journal club for residents and I did. And I was just keeping like the way I would handle um, being really pressed for time was putting more on my plate. And by the time I came to Hawaii, a true shift happened in that I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything more. And whether that was aging, you know, I'm 53 years old, whether that was like a 40 year old brain is different than a 50 year old brain. And, or the fact that I was no longer the sole breadwinner. I mean, I think there was an ease in thinking that I don't have to take everything and put it on my shoulder. There's somebody else now that can pick up the pace if I can't. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to know what, like it wasn't a conscious, clear, let me do a um, pros and cons, but it was a definite, I do not need extra shift. Mm -hmm. I do not need extra money. And I think that has stayed with me. That feeling that I need to make more money to do A, B, and C, or I'm going to run out of like that sense of scarcity yeah. really uh, uh, fell away. And when it fell away, I was able to choose only the things that truly brought me joy and truly allowed me to feel in Hawaii. And the word we use here is mana and mana is like you have your true light and when you are distracted and want to people please or trying to react or respond or trying to you know um, make a good impression on this person on that person every time you spend any time in that space you're taken away from your mana for your vital source for your true who you are and the more you can lean into that the more you know what to do. Yeah, that speaks so loudly to me. I'm rereading The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. Mm -hmm. And I just got off the chapter at what, where it does the exercises of listing what you're doing in a day and what do you want to do more of and what do you want to do less of. And even creating a list, I'm sure all of us feel like we have to put a million different things on the list. But when you said your antidote to being too busy was to schedule more, I completely resonate with that. And for me, I was, when I'm very overwhelmed, I'll add things to my list that I have control over. So it's like, in order to reduce the overwhelm, I think I'll add the things, but the things that I have control over rather than sit with it and be what can I reduce? Like what actually needs to get done today? Because then I feel really, I feel like I'm self-sabotaging by adding more. And then you're just paralyzed by, I have way too much on my list. Now I can't do anything at all. Have you felt that way before? Yeah. And you know, it's amazing that you say that is because you have something to show for. Um, before we went live, we're talking about running and identity. It's like, you have something to show for. And that's something is a sort of validation. Maybe you're not seeking a validation from other people, yeah. but it's like, maybe that's my legacy that I started this valley to get. Like your brain wants to seek out to A, get things that are controllable, but also like tangible. Like no one is going to be like, you know, Fariol, she was such a deep thinker. <laughs> like no one is going to care about that. So if you live from the space of how do you want to be seen? Do you want to be seen as, uh, you know, uh, as someone who does a lot of self-contemplation or do you want to be seen as someone who's like doing things and creating quote unquote lasting things? And I think what I'm trying to share with you is that as I've gotten older, I am much more leaning that just being, being like your shirt of yeah, just, just, be just, here. Yep. Yeah, just be here, just be here. Like don't have to start a journal club. I mean, it'd be wonderful if you wanted to do it, but you don't have to do it. And I think there was a voice in my head that had to do so much and somehow it's gone. Mm. And those are the messages for people that don't know your Facebook group. You have physicians living intentionally. Mm -hmm. And on right, your now best chapter, you have these really, I do think of you as a deep thinker, but I think the uh, deep thinking in this reflective always learning 
processing, mm -hmm. exploring, and sharing, sharing the messages you learned so beautifully with others. Um, but I understand what you think of like the overthinker, right? We don't want to necessarily be like, oh, overthinker. They were kind of like always an anxious person that was always trying to identify the next task that they had to do rather than be doing what you teach is learning how to be present, how to learn how to be still, despite the messages that we often get, which is that need to be busy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another statement that comes to my mind, like I don't have a tattoo, but if I had to get a tattoo, probably one of the things that would, but although you're just be here is a good one. Um, the concept of be still in knowing. And it sounds like it's not a complete sentence, but be still in knowing that everything is okay. I feel like, you know, people ask me like, what are your beliefs? And sometimes I've had clients who are like, you know, uh, I really, I, you know, your Buddhist way of thinking really appeals to me. It's like, I, I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I feel like if there's any philosophy that I, it kind of resonates with me is like the stoicisms, right? It's the whole amor fati, like, like loving your fate, the idea of the impermanence, right? Nothing is perfect. Nothing is complete. Um, in Japan, they talk about wabi-sabi, this concept of the imperfection of life. And if you can be still in knowing that that's just life and not trying to change it so badly. Mm. We talked about control. We talked about adding things, doing more. And I think that this is, so I know you have a lot of uh, physicians who listen and we have a lot of coaches and we have a lot of people who really want to positively in impact not only the life of other people, but the lives of themselves. Like we're drawn to uh, medicine or clinical work because we want to help people. And, and a teaching that I always share with people is that if you can't be loved, you can at least be helpful. And I think so many people go to helping fields because it's a second way of being loved. A second way of being honored. Like it's like a, it's like a sneaky way of you really want to be loved. So you help people. Yeah. So the idea of where your altruistic behavior, mm -hmm. you really get something out of it. Yeah. So I say that within the context that even in the world of self development and the passion for learning we always had this urge to learn more I did the um, teacher of presence training with Eckhart Tolle last year mm. and when that training finished then there's another training yeah hey you want to sign up for this training yeah and I have to tell you my practice because I so desire to do more so desire to learn deeper and is I want to be still. I don't want to learn more. I don't want more training. Would it be amazing? It would be. But I want to be still in knowing that I have all the wisdom already. That, and if I don't, it's okay. Yeah. Um, because wanting to do more training, I know it's my way of reaching for more. And I don't want to reach for more. Yeah. And it seems like there's a big shift going on where I'm hearing that message more and more and pausing whenever I want to sign up for something as well is what's the purpose of this training? Because it's like reading a self-development book. We read it, put it down, get the next one. That's you need read, apply, right? Like read, absorb, apply. And the stillness is really where we're absorbing, we're tuning inward and you're focusing in on exactly what you said, what already exists within me. And you work with people that have serious illness. And I, I went through a few bouts with my illness that became very serious where I didn't know if I'd still be here. And my response wasn't an immediate catalytic event to change my behaviors, meaning that I didn't go from being told I may not make it to then, well, I guess I'm going to shift my whole life so I can focus on what really matters to me. I went through, I you know, I was in a hospital that couldn't take care of me. So I went back to residency because 
that's what I knew. And so there's that discomfort, right, of the unlearning and that breaking the habit of, I used to be a person who would sign up for all these trainings. I used to be a person whose worth was dependent on these certifications. Did you go through a period where, or like, what does it look like if you have a training pop up on your screen? How do you process through and decide yay or nay? Yeah, so it's a great question. So the whole life coaching world, um, I did not know much about, actually, to be honest with you. And I learned about Sunny Smith. So those of you who listen, you may very well know her, who is this wonderful physician. She um, used to be a practicing family practice doc who, you know, ran a free clinic for indigent population in um, uh, California for years before having her own personal journey and uh, learning about the life coaching. And so she started a life coaching program. And so in 2020, right around COVID, when we're all sitting in and every interaction we have with people is masked, mm -hmm. like I really, really like the virtual space because I could see people's faces. Yeah. Right. So I think that while people think about, oh, you know, like we were all on Zoom, we were all Zoomed out and we we're all virtual. It was wonderful for me because at work I was wearing PPE. My patients were actively dying and everybody was partitioned. And so joining Sunny's program in 2020 at the heat of COVID, where I could see these other physicians' faces online and you know, resonating on the same wavelength that we are burning out together and we're not alone. And this is a common human experience and sharing that, you know, suffering or retelling our suffering takes away the shame and just makes us whole again. Like I never had that experience in my life ever, you know, like in what space have we as physicians, like in what space have we been giving you're okay, you're not alone. And I, I've never had that space ever in my life. Mm. And I always say I wasn't broken or I didn't know if I was broken. So I didn't go in searching for something. I was like, I don't know what else is out there for me. But just being in that space, allowing me to think outside the box, um, allowing me to think I don't have to be a practicing physician. Like that was so weird. Like yeah. I came back to medicine from a place of love, not scarcity. But when I left it also was from a place of love and not scarcity. You know, it was like, I love this, but I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. Like I, I'm good. I don't have to. And then I missed the patient and came back. So I feel like I left it for the right reasons. I came back to it for the right reasons. But I don't think that I did this just like impulsively. It was thoughtfulness from learning to coach my brain. And I've never done that before. Yeah. So once I knew there was tools and there was a school that taught these things, I didn't do, I know you did an extensive search. You're like, let me study this school. Let me study that school. I just went with, hey, this person is a great coach and she went to the school. Let me go mm -hmm. to this. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if if I had to do thing over again or if people reached out to me to say, do you recommend the school that you got your certification in? I don't know if I would say yes, because since then I've gotten other certifications. Like I have- yeah wellness coaches certification, which is what a lot of physicians um, through like, I know Mass General has their own life coaches for their physicians. That's the training. So that training to me has been more comprehensive in terms of wellness coaching. Whereas the training that I got, the first training that I got um, was more of a, a almost like a, they, they teach you this particular uh, way of thinking, which is very similar to Zoroastrianism, which is my Iranian, you know, heritage. A lot of like looking at the 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 state statement in Zoroastrian is Zoroastrianism is um, good thought, good deed, good act, mm -hmm. and and it just means that you sort of need to have these things together, and essentially the teaching that it had that. Uh, first life coach training certification I received was really putting that into a construct that I could teach a client and they could put it in 
So I say that to the fact that I had a client that I just finished working with. I loved him dearly. I still do. 89 year old retired physician. And, and he was like, you know, Fariel, just you telling me that concept of what's fact and what fic what's fiction, let's just focus our thoughts about facts has changed me. So I worked with this man for like 12 weeks and that simple teaching yeah. carried him for 12 weeks. So now I don't want to get any more training. When I hear about other training, I do not, I, the decision is I don't sign up for it. Would I enjoy it? I would enjoy it, but it would f add things into my life that I already don't need anymore. Like you yeah. said, I already have the books that I can spend the time to reapply those knowledges. Does that make yeah. sense? It totally makes sense. When I am thinking about a course to say, how else can I learn this? And what am I seeking out of it? And what you said about a lot of people do different coaching programs, not necessarily because they want more certifications, but because the way that they coach it some is really hard for a program to have everything, right? So some get the extra training for trauma or for somatic healing where um, the school you, you went to is very much more cognitive, like CBT. It reminds me of CBT, which is very helpful when people need a structure, like what you said. If you're in the depths of exhaustion, having a framework that's quite easy and can provide you instant relief is so helpful where I, you know, I really value the, uh, all the coaches that I've had that trained at the same school. And I found that I looked at a few, but I was doing it more off of intuition. Like who do I vibe with? Mm -hmm. And what I vibe with Martha Beck, because I, her story is similar, like her path, the way that she found that she was like at Harvard and she's like, screw it all. This isn't for me. And she shared some personal struggles that I share with her so I could see myself in her. And I was looking for some embodiment, which a lot of people, like I said, no matter what school, they might go back for that, but it was more of what do I need to heal? Uh, mm -hmm. as often as coaches, we, you know, attract the people that are, have s similar pain mm -hmm. points that we had when we were looking for these healing modalities. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. what would be helpful for me? Mm -hmm. And as I'm learning, it's very helpful that I tuned into that because I find that then we're prepared to serve those who resonate with our own stories. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's your ultimate, if you want to help another human being, especially in the, you know, in the world of like, I don't have to have cancer to take care of a cancer patient, Yeah, but I feel like in terms of cognitive help, um, it is helpful. It's not mandatory. Like um, my sister run, runs a drug and alcohol rehab center and she has done so for gosh, 35 years or so. Um, and she's not, she never drinks alcohol. Mm -hmm. So does she need to drink alcohol to understand, you know, their plight? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that's a necessity, but a lot of patients and clients resonate better with the therapists who are survivors themselves. Yeah. So I think that like people say like, who is your ideal client? Like, who do you work with? So I will tell you like a little backstory of why I even went to life coaching is that I wanted to provide life coaching with pe for people with serious illness. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't want to right now, most of my clients that I, I'm a coach for are physician moms. They don't have to be a mom. They don't have to be, I mean, you know, they don't have to be a physician, but the majority of my clients are physician moms. And I think one reason that is, is that I am helping myself 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. I'm helping that whack-a-mole whack mom that was signing up for more with the little kids that never saw her. Yeah. Those are the people that are drawn to me because they want to slow down. Yeah. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you yeah. just want to they don't want to say, oh my God, that was fast. They don't want to look at their life and yeah, they lost, yeah. the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so those are the people that are drawn to me because that's the part of me that healed. Yeah. But I went to coaching. I wanted to help people with serious illness because when they're so focused on what if this is cancer? What if this is coming back? What if I die? I just wanted to say, you're not dead yet. Yeah. 
can I give you the tools to enjoy your life? Like, that's why I went to be a life coach. I joke that I'm a life and death coach, but I, I really want to help your mindset if yeah. you have a serious illness. And then that turned into, I have clients who have had personal grief, mm -hmm. lost their child, lost their spouse, lost, lost their sister, lost their mom. Or I have some physician clients that send me their mother-in-law who's diagnosed with something. So those are the people I really want to help. Now, when I think about it, when you say about, can I get more? Like, I was like, could I get more training in being a grief counselor? Like I could, right? Because that's what I do. But I do believe I have all the tools. Yeah, for sure. And you yeah. know why I think that? Because they have all the tools. Yes. Yeah. And you are a, very in tune with the human soul, the human spirit holding space. I think the value of holding space is undervalued. It's not taught well in medicine. So I went into coaching when I was facing my serious illness and I had the philosophy of, I need to learn how to hold space for self. And I also work in with patients with cancer and hold space for them when their emotions were so strong that, and I didn't have a cure for them. We're not mm -hmm. taught how to sit with that and mm -hmm. to allow them to verbalize what's coming up for them and to sit in the concern, the fear, the anxiety that comes up. Mm -hmm. And so from my own perspective as a patient, had I been coaching with you, it's, it's so valuable. Uh, I had kind of surrendered to the circumstance at the time and to learn coaching helped. What is in control? What is like, what is in your control right now? And what is not? rather than having that learned helplessness and surrender to the inevitable. And that really helped me to reclaim the narrative of my life and ownership of my life. And of course, we know that some people with serious illness, it will be, you know, an end of life. I really love how you said that you're also a death coach. In medical school, one of my favorite projects I created was how to live a good death, because I find that we often abandon people when we're not able to give them a solution to their diagnosis. And I was curious in terms of the people who haven't had the opportunity to learn these skills through experience, experience, how would you advise physicians to change kind of how we're taught so that they can better connect with people with serious illness or that need a little bit more human support? I, I have one episode uh, on my podcast, which I, I can't think about the title right now, but I talk about it and that's about holding space. I want to say the third or fourth episode very early on because I really wanted to teach this uh, this concept. And I, I will even just quickly just, you know, segue to why I started a podcast. It was during COVID and there was much more death and dying happening in New York and the East Coast. And we were all on social media. Like I was never on Facebook as much as I was during COVID. Mm -hmm. And part of it was like we were hungry for information, like what was happening in New York yeah. and here in Hawaii, you know, we were very late. So it's like, I remember anytime I said something, I had a couple of snarky friends on the East Coast and they'd be like, oh, what are you talking about? Like, you don't have it. And then I just realized they don't have their resources. They were physicians who had to have these palliative care conversations that didn't have the tools. So I thought, what if I created a podcast? And I remember it was May 2020. And I was like, what if I created a podcast that not only taught physicians how to have these conversations but also taught patients to think about these things so like don't wait until you're about to get you know pegged and traked and all the jazz to have yeah. thinking what is a quality living look like to me so like how can you offer people soft landing before they're about to crash so I started my podcast with that idea in mind like and and a lot of the earlier episodes is just me talking to my $19 mic and talking to the audience about, you know, what you should do or what you should think about all this. And so the idea of holding space is, is that uh, it's, it's, it's not a skill that we are taught and it's not a skill that is easy. And I, and I will give you an example. Um, so the audience who's listening can maybe resonate with this picture a patient comes to your office 40 year old mom of like three kids and she has pancreatic cancer and she was just given this diagnosis. Right. And, and she's Googled it. 
she knows mm -hmm. the outcomes are not great, right? Mm -hmm. Our tendency when we sit with that discomfort is to run and say, but there's so many new studies. Yeah. Or I have this, you know, my neighbor's cousin five years out. Like we can't sit with human suffering. We sort of want to cheer everybody up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And holding space, you know, the, the term attending physician is attending to suffering. Mm. Hmm. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Yes. Huh. Yes. Hmm. Attending, attending to human suffering. And what do we do now? We're like attending by being on our computer, you know, putting the EMR, making sure like all the charts are this pre off that. Like I, when I'm with the patient, it's like attending is so hard because yeah. I'm being constantly, you know, there's a tiger text from this nurse and this MA and then this physician. And it's like, I can't attend to a patient. Yeah. And attend doesn't mean give him a pain medication, give him like anti-emetic, which we do still. Attending means sit with the fact that this 40-year-old mother of two kids is just just went from a land of living and all is good to this land of uncertainty. And not like she's gonna die right now, but she just made a move that she didn't want to. But can you sit with that suffering without giving advice, without having to cheer her up, without telling her about new immunotherapy that's out there? I want to pause on that question and sit with the silence of it. So what are people going to want to do? They're going to want to talk in the silence. And that's what it feels like. It's sitting in that discomfort. And uh, when we are offering these solutions, it's not for the patient. It's to re relieve the discomfort that we're sitting in. It's interesting that you chose that case because that case came to me my third year of medical school and I sat with that patient and my feedback from the rotation was I spent too much time in the patient's room and I walked away from that feedback and I said, and I'd do it again. Like I didn't say that, but I was like, and I would do it again because I knew at the time um, the pain of loneliness when you were feeling like you're abandoned when you were just given the most challenging news you've probably ever heard in your life. So I really appreciate that you shared that story and also the role that you play in the lives of so many. And I hope that you sharing that story inspires other people to take on that challenge, to learn how to sit, observe what comes up and how can I get more practice in sitting with this discomfort? And, you know, I want to be honest with you is that it's not easy, mm -hmm. but I think you don't have to wait for a patient's terminal diagnosis to practice this. You could do this with your spouse. Yeah. You could do this with your kid. You can do this with a colleague who just tells you that they're going to have a divorce, you know, without giving advice, without cheering, like holding space means not going on the other side and trying to yank people out of whatever state they are in, whether it's shocked, whether it's denial, whether it's deep grief, whether it's, you know, fear, just sit with that feeling. And the analogy I always tell people is like, it's like telling someone that their plane is going to crash, but somehow you're not going to die. right? You're sitting next to someone on a plane. You're saying, you know what? This plane is going to crash, but I'm going to make it. Like, how do you sit with that suffering and that anxiety? Like, how are you going to cheer someone up like that? So being an attending is to attend human suffering. And there's a very famous uh, painting 
that's in National Museum of Art. I think it's in Washington, D.C., but you know how these are, and now it could be in Philadelphia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a big picture of this man. It clearly looks like a doctor, and there's a child that looks like it's either dying or dead, and there's a mom that's very anxious in a corner. There's light coming through the uh, window that looks like maybe it's dawn. Maybe the physician has been there all night long mom is crying there is crumpled stuff on the ground and it's like I love that picture because no medication is being given and that kid may die in an hour but the attending experience comes over you that mom is not suffering the loss of this child alone the physician is there to experience it and we don't go there because we just want to go to the next thing. And I think the fear is that it's going to take a very long time. So my husband is a radiation oncologist. So when I was teaching her about, about this, he's like, so how long do I wait? Like that pause that you invited today, like how long does that take? And the answer is until they start talking. And it's not as long as you think, but it feels very long. It feels like 10 minutes. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that I've observed that a lot of the moral injury and burnout is from lack of ability to connect and provide the care that you desire to care as a healer. Mm -hmm. And having that capacity to connect and truly to feel your presence with that person and that person with you, I'm like, that is medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I truly feel like if you want to leave patients with an amazing medical intervention that has no side effect for them, try practicing holding space. Have you ever practiced holding space for yourself? Yes. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> every day yeah every day anything that comes up for me like you know we were talking anything that comes up for me if I'm not doing something right or if I'm doing something wrong or if I've injured my body or if I've snapped at my kids or if I you know uh, lose it in my day all of these little spikes of dis-ease in my day are my teachers mm. And I notice them and I notice them. And you talked about one degree. I notice that I'm going off track and how do I course correct? And it won't come to zero, but how can I course, how can I do something that would make it a little better? And holding space for me is like asking questions because, you know, we talk about that this, you know, this famous statement from Viktor Frankl, who everybody talks about that you know between stimulus and response there's a space and in that space is our freedom and in that space is how do you respond and not react you actually need to put something to create an artificial pause like you have to pause yeah and that holding silence in your mind is taking the discomforts in your day taking the self-judgment and self-criticism in your day and making every single one of them your teacher. Right? So I have two kids, very different personality. And the one that I struggle the most with, she's my greatest teacher. Yeah. So yeah, I practice every day. It's you know, when I'm thinking about feedback we get online, a lot of people are afraid to be visible online. And if I get a comment that triggers something in me, activates something within me, kind of like what you're pointing out with that butting heads, or if people give you feedback, what I like to observe is what is this bringing up for me? And what is that comment or behavior showing me about them, right? From my perspective, but being curious. I think it really helps to take a step back and not, I, I would otherwise personalize everything. 
Um, but I think having self-compassion and curiosity is very helpful in those moments. And I know I have had you here for quite a long time, but I can't let our discussion go without sharing just a little bit more about these retreats. If you don't mind telling the audience oh, about those. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I love that you said curiosity because I feel like if, I, if there's only one thing I want to leave the audience who's listening to this or any of this was like somehow moving to them is that curiosity. You don't want to take judgment. Oh, I never do that. I, <clears throat> just saying, oh, this sounds interesting. I'm curious how I can, you know, create these spaces. Like if you could just use curiosity, anytime you want to judge yourself, every time you want things to be different. I'm curious why I snapped at my kid. I, I'm curious. Like if you could just use curiosity every single day, when you're talking to yourself, use the word curious. I'm curious why I feel like this. I'm curious why I reacted this way. If you could just use curiosity, life, the world would be a better place. Um, the retreats. Yes. Thank you for asking. So this is my third year and it's a very intimate retreat. It's not a conference. It's not a CME specifically. I was like, I want people to come to take care of themselves. It's on Oahu, which is the island I'm in, and it's at Turtle Bay Resort, which is one of the most beautiful places. It's sacred. It's not, when you think about Honolulu, which is essentially, no offense, but it's like Los Angeles on a rock. Um, but like Turtle Bay is the most beautiful place. I had someone who was at Four Seasons and drove to Turtle Bay to my retreat. They were a speaker at Four Seasons. And then she's like, thank you for this place, this mm -hmm. place instantly gave me what I needed and so it used to be three days but because of everybody said we need four days so this year uh, it's October 2nd to the 6th it's four days and I have my absolute best most favorite cancer survivors and yoga teachers the meditation teachers that are part of my program guide you through these completely life-changing practices with breath work on you know facing the ocean. I can't even describe when you're doing yoga, you can feel a little bit of that ocean spray on your body. It's really healing. And I will say, sadly, this is the last year I will hold it in Hawaii. And I think that I am sort of transitioning, maybe doing more in Japan or something international. Wow, but nice. Those of you, so it's filled, half filled already. If you want to come and be part of this unbelievable experience, you can come, we make personal, you know, flower crowns that you make up for yourself, you crown yourself, we will go to this amazing um, experience of Polynesian dance, fire dance, this is going to be just magnificent. I can't explain it. Maybe you can ask people who've been there. Yeah. But um, I would love nothing more to have uh, it's but for physician moms only. Um, so I want to create that, you know, safe space that people can share and open up. And, you know, it, when people say, what do you talk about? It's very much like this conversation. It's really um, t coming back to your mana, coming back to your true self and living from that place of the true light that you actually are. That is a beautiful takeaway. And I was curious if there's any other takeaways you want to leave with the audience. Yeah, you know. I want to just say one thing that's very, very important. I say this all the time. Anytime you're frustrated and every time you feel like anxiety is coming up and you're like, oh, this is going to, this is going to go bad. This is going to be bad. Always remember this. Just remember this line for me that if it can go wrong, it can also go right. Anytime, in any situation. And all you're doing, I'm not trying to, you know, infuse you with positive toxic positivity is that give equal airtime to the brain wave and the internal voice that says things could also go right mm. and if you can't talk to yourself compassionately like a 53 year old person talk to your eight-year-old person compassionately and tell her if things can go wrong they can equally go right so that sentence love that I, that this has been helpful i love that and what's the best way for them to get in contact with you 
Yeah, just go to www.drfariel.com. Like you said, the podcast is write your best chapter. Yeah. And I have about, I don't know, 130 episodes there. And you are one of the interviewees. Woot! If anything, they should come back and listen to our conversation yeah. again. It was so good. What a, what a treat to see, sit down and chat with you today. Yeah, it was my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me, Fariel. Have a great day. You too. Until Bye. next time, everyone. Bye.